dry half-winter surveyed the mountains that rose up out of the mist ahead. Full winter's grip had relaxed. The snow and ice had mostly gone. The green shoots of half-summer were sprouting. Eli's eyes narrowed. The summit was a good day's climb by his reckoning, and the way looked perilous steep. The high sun cast long shadows down the ochre-brown rock face like stains. Eli glanced north along the range, then south. The mountain seemed to stretch off into the distance forever, and he was loath to set out on such a detour. Looking up, the crag climber saw dozens of worms flitting round the crag tops and upper ledges. Striped orange manderworms, spike backs, metallic blue wings. He heard their squeaks and chitterings echo off the wall of rock as they pitched and dived in search of insects. He looked down again, scouring the lower reaches of the mountains. His gaze fell upon a jagged black crevice away to the south, It was a cleft through the rock, large enough for worms to pass through. The scree at the entrance looked trampled and it was spattered with worm dung. This was what he had been looking for, a worm trail, one of the migration routes that linked winter hideout to half-summer pastures. As Eli approached, he found that the crack in the rock was narrower than he had thought, just wide enough for the great lumbering grey worms to pass through in single file. He stepped into it. The sun was snuffed out like a candle flame, and the air felt chill. High above his head was a thin slit of blue sky. The rock was sheer and dark at his sides, and at the most constricted points of the trail, it had been chafed and grazed by the flanks of the migrating herds. The shadowed track dog-legged sharply to the left, then right again, then opened up. Eli found himself on a small stretch of flat sand. It was enclosed by vertical rock faces that rose up around him, curved and ridged like giant hands. Behind him was the narrow opening he had entered. In front of him, blocking the way ahead, was a great pitted boulder. Except it wasn't a boulder. It was a grey worm, massive, recumbent and dead. The corpse was lying on its side, the back bowed, turned away, the long neck and thick tail curved round towards him, and between them the four limbs outstretched, claw stiff. The head of the creature was draped over a slab of rock, its great maw gaping open to reveal rows of yellow pearl teeth. Deep, empty black eye sockets stared blindly at him. It was a bull male, seventy summers old by the looks of it, perhaps even older than that. Eli rested a hand on the hard, cracked skin of the grey worm's flanks. It hung loose over the framework of jutting bones beneath. The creature must have died just before the start of full winter. Its body had been covered with thick snow that had protected it from the carrion worms and other scavengers and frozen it solid. With the thaw, the wind whistling through the ravine had dried the body out, mummifying the remains and rendering its skin and flesh too brittle and desiccated to be of use. But the teeth and claws, now they were a different matter. Eli straightened up. He pulled his rucksack from his back and set it on the ground. He loosened the ties. He pulled out a small hammer, a pair of pliers, then unsheathed the knife at his belt. The claws of the grey worm's hind feet were brown and nubbed, but beneath the pitted surface, Eli knew they'd be fine-grained and make for excellent carving. They would bring high rewards at the scrimshaw den. He set to work. The knack was to slide the point of the knife in at the back of the toe, where the curve of the claw left a small gap between the knuckle and the scaly skin, and twist. Eli jerked the handle round and the blade sliced through the tendons like they were yarns of wool. Then, keeping the knife in place, he gripped the claw with the pliers and wrenched it back hard, twisting as he did so. There was a dull cracking sound and the claw came away from the foot. He turned it over in his hand appraisingly, then set it down on the sand. Eli removed all twelve of the claws from the hind feet, then he moved on to those at the front. These were sharper, paler, They would make a fine set of rock spikes. Eli took a swig of water from the water gourd at his side, mopped his brow, then set to work again. He started humming. It was a plodding, tuneless rendition of something he had once heard. He wasn't even aware of doing it. When the last of the front claws had been extracted, Eli pushed back his hat and turned his attention to the teeth. He peered into the dark, yawning hole of the creature's maw, then reached inside. He ran his fingertips over the spike of an eye tooth, the chisel edge of an incisor. Using his knife, Eli drove the blade down between the teeth, one after the other, and sawed into the gums. He worked swiftly and efficiently. When the final cut had been made, Eli straightened up. The teeth were loose now. Setting the knife aside, he seized a front tooth with the pliers, then tap, tap, tap at the gum with the hammer. Slowly, gently, taking care not to crack the enamel, until with one almost 
Something like a sigh, the gum finally gave up its grip on the roots and the tooth came free. Eli turned it over in his hand, then laid it down next to the claws. It was a fine specimen and he would have liked to point out its qualities to the boy. In fact, its size alone would furnish a dozen knife handles. With its grain, even finer than the grey worm's claws, would make for flawless carving. But Micah was not there. He was off on the high bluffs to the west with the girl, Kara.